Hello Internet and welcome back to another video on the EJ Black YouTube channel. It's been a while since I've sat down and looked at the camera doing a direct talking video, but I thought since it's the end of the year, I wanted to go over my top 50 albums of 2021. So for each of these albums, I'm going to give them their ranking out of 50 and then a score, which I've already given them. And you can see on album of the year, I'll put my account in the description if you're curious at all to see what I rank everything else. I'm also going to have a list of every album I've listened to this year in order on there. So you can see what I thought of albums like CLB and Donda, which aren't going to be in this top 50, unfortunately. My 50th favorite record of the year was Cake Pop 2 by Cake Pop. I'm a massive fan of 100 Gex and anything that Dylan Brady and Laura Les touch is instantly gold. And so I thought this record was really, really good and really, really strong. While some of the middle tracks were a little bit worse than the beginning and end, the beginning and end of these tracks made it so worth listening to, even if it wasn't entertaining consistently. And so Cake Pop I gave a 7.6 out of 10. It's Carnage by Nick Cave and Warren Ellis. So this one was an art rock project that I didn't expect to like going into it, but I liked a lot more. It had kind of that post artistic rock sound, which isn't really unique these days, but I thought they did it really well and in an interesting enough way that it showed up this high. And so Carnage, I gave a 7.7 7 out of 10. 48th on this list was Bo Jackson by Baldy James and the Alchemist. I really like The Alchemist. His jazz rap production style is always interesting. And he's done a lot of records this year that I thought were really, really good. This was one of the ones that I thought had some of the most interesting production. And while Baldy James isn't someone who I'm necessarily a fan of, I thought his rapping worked really well in this style and with this type of production, which is why whenever he works with The Alchemist, it tends to turn out a lot better than his solo projects, in my opinion. This album I also ranked a 7.7 7 out of 10. 47th on my list was Glow On by Turnstile. It was a post-hardcore record, and it was a little bit interesting. It had a very ethereal quality to it. It wasn't like the typical post-hardcore you'd hear. It had a lot more of an ambient sound going with it that I think worked really well in this context, despite it being often juxtaposed to the harder post-rock sounds. This album I also gave a 7.7 7 out of 10, and I think we're going to see a lot of repeat scores. 46 was Live Laugh ASAP by ASAP Rocky. This was a re-release of one of his earlier albums, I believe from 2011. And while I've never listened to the original, I thought that this was a really good record, and it was actually better than some of the stuff that he's released later in his career. So I found this a really enjoyable listen, and while it was a little bit hard on my first try, maybe because I'm not a massive fan of ASAP Rocky, on subsequent listens I found it a lot more enjoyable. So I think this is a pretty good record and I gave it a 7.7 7 out of 10. Next was an EP called Don't Kiss Your Friends by My A. This one I also wasn't really expecting to like. It was a much more bland take on pop than something that I normally like, but I still found it really enjoyable to listen to, even though it's not normally my cup of tea. Um, and so this one I also gave a 7.7 7 out of 10. Next was An Evening with Silk Sonic by Silk Sonic Evidently. This one was one that I heard a lot of really good reviews about going into it. And while I can see why a lot of people liked it, it wasn't as high as some of the other releases I've heard this year. That being said, it was a really good take on modern R&B, and it still had a lot of the nostalgia from the previous sounds that made it really good to listen to, and made it a lot better than Bruno Mars' previous work. I haven't listened to Anderson Pack, so I can't comment on his previous work though. This one I gave a 7.8 out of 10 to. The next one is If I Could Go Back by Mitch Jones. This was made by a Twitch streamer called Mitch Jones, who stopped Twitch streaming to focus on his music career, which I think is a really cool step to take. This was an emo record that looked at his life and his friendships, and while it was only an EP, so it didn't go into much detail, I thought it looked at these ideas in a really cool way. It wasn't anything super unique, but I think that he could really make this style his own, and especially with his really powerful voice, I think that he could make some of his future records really interesting. This one I also gave a 7.8 out of 10 to. Next in number 42 is Cloud Covered by Cloud's Taste Satanic. This was a doom metal record that I found just randomly while looking through some albums, and I thought it was really interesting. So Cloud Covered is a record of cover songs by the band Cloud's Taste Satanic, but it took a lot of songs that aren't typically performed in a metal style or originally aren't a metal song and played it with this really cool doom metal style that made it fit this style even though it's not how it's originally performed. So this is an album that I gave a 7.9 out of 10 to. Next on the list is Hello Los Angeles by 111 Night Shift. This was a glitchcore record. I got into glitchcore a lot more this year. It hasn't really been something I've heard in the past. By the way, I know I'm supposed to call it scenecore or hyperpop, but I don't care. Um, I found this record really enjoyable. It took a lot of the ideas I'd heard in a lot of other songs of the genre, but made it something that was a lot more unique to them. 
So I gave this one a 7.9 out of 10. Next was SNS by No Point in Living. No Point in Living is one of my favorite bands. They do a lot of DSBM, melodic black metal, melodic death metal, and a lot of fusions of those genres. And they release a lot of albums in a year. Um, I believe it's just one guy living in Japan. And while he's got some side projects, this one is actually my favorite. And I didn't listen to everything he released this year, so not everything is going to be on this list. But the ones I did listen to all showed up on this list. This record specifically was a melodic death metal record. And while the vocals of melodic death metal in general, but specifically this record, weren't really for me, I really, really like the melodic guitar style. And the way that it shows its emotions through its guitar playing is something that I find really enjoyable. And even though melodic death metal is normally supposed to be really emotional, I found this one's take a lot better than the average melodic death metal record. This one I also gave a 7.9 out of 10 to. Next is Suicide Letter to Myself by Miv or M1B. Um, this was a glitchcore EP and this one had a lot more punk elements than sophomore vampires. So this one was a purely solo release by Miv. And while I really liked that at first, after a while it tended to get a little bit grating and that vocal style tended to wear off me a little bit but I still ended up enjoying it enough evidently to be on my top 50 list. This one I also gave a 7.9 out of 10 to, and I do really recommend this release, especially listening to it a couple times, but I wouldn't recommend listening to it a whole lot because I think that might be what drew me out of it. Number 38 on my list is Golden Token Volume 2 by Static Global Boys. While I'm friends with one of the members, I think this is a fair rating. I tried to be as fair as I can, even if the people who made the album were my friend, and I thought that he did a really good job he uses a lot of samples from songs I already like, but he takes them and moves them to different genres, which I think is a really interesting way to remix your music. I think it's really cool to hear these songs that I already liked recontextualized into these new genres. And so I thought this was a pretty good record, and for it being one of his first mixtapes especially, I thought it was really good. And so this one I gave a 7.9 out of 10 as well. 37 on my list was Sour by Olivia Rodrigo. I don't know if this is a controversial opinion for someone who's a bit of a music nerd to like it so much, but I really did enjoy this album. While it was a somewhat typical take on pop, I thought it was performed really well, and even though you may call it an industry plant since she was in Disney beforehand, I really think that this record's emotions actually came from Olivia herself and that they really come off in the album, which is what you want out of an album, whether it's an industry planted album or not. So I thought it was pretty enjoyable and I gave it a 7.9 out of 10. Number 36 on my list is a mixtape called Waves by Como. This was another one of those smaller releases that I really enjoyed. The production was something that was really interesting and I thought the theme of the ocean worked really well with what he was producing. And so this one I gave an 8 out of 10 too. Next was Kick 2 by Arca. I thought that Arca's Kick albums were all really interesting and really good. And I think she did a really good job making them all something that was unique. While Kick 2 wasn't the most consistent record from the Kicks, I think that Kick 2 had the best songs on it, that being Prada and Ricarda. I think that's how you'd pronounce it, I'm not sure. I really like her Latin Venezuelan influence in her electronic, more glitch poppy music. And so this album I also rated an 8 out of 10. 34 on the list is Super Tecmo Boy by Baldy James and The Alchemist. So I already mentioned this duo earlier, and this was a better record they made this year. I really love The Alchemist's jazz production, as I said earlier, and I thought that they worked really well together this year. I'd like to see more of their stuff in the future, and I think that they could make a really good pair in future as well, and make a lot better albums, even though these ones were already really good. So I look forward to seeing what they do in the future. 33 on the list was Promises by Floating Points and Pharaoh Sanders. This was a neoclassical record that took one idea and made a lot of variations throughout the whole thing using a full symphony, which I thought was a really cool way of performing this idea. And also the fact that it managed to use this one simple idea and stretch it out over 40 minutes without being boring at all is a testament to how good this album is. And so this was one I also rated an 8 out of 10. Next was Motionless Watching You by Sadness. This was a DSPM record and I'm someone who really really loves Sadness. They have another record that they released a few years ago called I Wanna Be There and that one is in my top 5 albums of all time. So even though I always love what Sadness does, I thought that this one was a little bit worse than their typical album but still something that was really enjoyable and, and has a lot of emotion in it. So I thought it was at least good enough to give an 8 out of 10 to. 31 on the list is Kick 3 by Arca. So as I said, I didn't think Kick 2 was the most consistent and while Kick 2 has the better songs on it, I think that Kick 3 as a full record is more enjoyable and probably one that I'm going to listen to in full more often than Kick 2. So this one I gave an 8.1 out of 10 to. 30th on the list was Boneyard aka Fearmonger by The Underscores. The Underscores released two records this year 
and they take this really strong hyper poppy sound that I already enjoy in a lot of other artists and manage to really make this sound their own by again using a lot of punk influences or entirely different punk influences to a lot of the other popular hyper pop and glitchcore bands. I thought this was a really good sequel to their previous album which also came out this year and I look forward to hearing their future albums. Number 29 on the list is Garbology by Aesop Rock and Blockhead. I'm a massive fan of Aesop Rock, Nun Shall Pass is one of my favourite albums ever and the self-titled song on Nun Shall Pass is one of my favourite songs of all time. And Blockhead works really well with Aesop Rock, his production is exceptional on its own but with Aesop Rock's really unique flow and rapping style I think it works really well and creates a really unique hip hop record that still manages to be something that I think any hip hop head can listen to. This one I also gave a 8.1 out of 10 to. Next is the Jammed EP by Luna Lee. Luna Lee has released a lot of singles in the past, um, but this was her first longer release. It had 10 songs on it, even though every song was only one minute, so it's still only a 10 minute release. While a lot of it seemed disjointed in terms of the structure of the album, I thought that every song was really cool. Um, they were layered really beautifully, and they all used a lot of instruments in really cool ways and were all played by her, which I think is really cool and really interesting. So I gave this album an 8.1 out of 10 as well. Next is Lil Mariko's self-titled EP. I thought that this was a really interesting EP, it had some really weird songs on it. It was a hyper pop EP but it used a lot of ideas from other genres, there was a lot of metal screaming in there which I thought was really cool, um, and it was really really over the top. It almost comes off as a parody of itself in a way, but while it's really over the top and some people might find it satirical or humorous, I still thought it was really good. And so this one I also gave an 8.1 out of 10 too. In spot 26 we have Hitler Wears Herms 8 Side B by West Side Gun. Um, I only found out about West Side Gun this year and I think that he has a really unique voice and a really unique style in the jazz rap scene. Um, and while I haven't listened to a lot of his other records, after listening to this record I really want to because he has a really consistent sound that still manages to stay fresh for the whole album length and I wonder if it stays that consistent throughout the whole previous 8 installments of the Hitler Wears Home series. And so this one I gave an 8.2 out of 10 to. Next we have Possessed by No Point in Living. This one was another death metal record by No Point in Living, although it did have black metal elements, and I think everything I can say about No Point in Living was said earlier. But this was a really cool and emotional take on that genre, and I think that No Point in Living did a really good job. This one I also gave an 8.2 out of 10 to. Next is April Sunset by Sadness. This is another DSPM record by Sadness that they released this year, and it used a lot of sound effects in this one to convey the emotions, which while I thought at times was a little bit gimmicky, um, still at times worked pretty well with the themes of the album, um, that being depression because it's DSBM. And while this definitely wasn't the most unique Sadness record ever released, I still think it's really good, and so I gave this one an 8.2 out of 10 as well. Number 23 on the list is 12 Temples by Questmaster. This was a dungeon synth record, which I know a lot of people haven't heard of, but it kind of takes the atmospheric black metal from the 90s and takes out the black metal, so it's just those ambient parts. And I think that dungeon synth as a genre is really cool, I've loved it for about 5 years. And this was a really good record in the genre. I think it stayed pretty true to that fantasy sound while still having its own unique story to tell in its structure and songwriting. So I gave this one also an 8.2 out of 10. Number 22 on our list is Nameless Emotions by No Point in Living. This is the last installment from No Point in Living on the list, but this one is the most DSBM out of all of them. It has the most black metal elements. Listening to this one, you get a lot more emotion than you did from the previous records by them, but it still had the death metal elements that made it really hard hitting and powerful, and still had those typical No Point in Living vocals that I think are really entertaining. I managed to make No Point in Living one of the most consistent bands in this genre that released this many records a year, and so I gave this one an 8.3 out of 10. Next we have Samayan Ceremonies, I believe that would be how you pronounced it by Capre Idolum, and I believe that's how you pronounce that part. This was a raw black metal album, and while it was very raw and visceral, it still managed to have a lot of melody and a lot of interesting sounds that you don't actually hear in black metal very often. It managed to combine it with a lot of other genres that weren't just black metal, despite it having the core traits that make black metal what it is. And so I think that this was a really interesting take on black metal, and I think it deserves to be this high on my list, which is a 8.3 out of 10. Number 20 on the list, so we're in the top 20 now, is Call Me If You Get Lost by Tyler the Creator. So while I think that Igor is one of the best albums ever made, if not the best album that I've ever listened to at least, I think Tyler came back with an album that, while straying in style, was still a really interesting album and evidently one of the best of this year. While it's not really comparable to Igor in any way, I think this is a good release in its own right and is more comparable to something like Flower Boy, which I think is about the same quality. And so this one I also gave an 8.3 out of 10 too. 
Next we've got Roadrunner, New Light, New Machine by Brockhampton. This was a hip hop record by one of my favorite rap groups, Brockhampton. And it looks at a lot of darker themes in the previous album, that being because one of the members, Joba, had his father commit suicide, which is a theme that they touched on in the album a couple times. I think these themes were looked at in a really, really tasteful way, while also telling you a lot about the people that they affect, namely Joba. And so I think that this album was one of the strongest hip hop records of this year. This album I also gave an 8.3 out of 10 to, and I'd love to see what Brockhampton do left because the Saturation Trilogy is my favourite series of albums of all time. Number 18 on our list is Gold Token Volume 1 by Static Global Boys. So this is obviously the prequel to Golden Token Volume 2, and I thought that this one was a lot better than the second one, evidently. This one used samples from the likes of Playboy Cardi, which I thought was really cool, and Again, it really recontextualizes the songs into something that you can listen to in a different context and it sounds a whole lot different. So that's why this is ranked so highly and I gave this one an 8.3 out of 10. Next is Haram by Armand Hammer and The Alchemist. So The Alchemist has already shown up twice on this list but now he's in a different duo, that being with Armand Hammer. And Armand Hammer has a very interesting, unique flow which has become a lot more popular in previous years, but still because he's one of the four founders of that unique sound, has a distinct charm to it. And the Alchemist jazz production really helps to bring Armin Hammer's voice to life. And so I think that this was a pretty good hip hop record with a really interesting jazzy sound. And so for that, I give it an 8.3 out of 10. Number 16 on this list is LP by JPEG Mafia. Now this is LP, the online version specifically, and you'll see why evidently later. And so I'll talk about it more then. I think you know what that means. But this album, the online version specifically, I gave an 8.3 out of 10 to. Number 15 on the list is This Thing of Ours by The Alchemist. So this was another Alchemist release, but this time he wasn't pairing up with one person, instead having multiple vocalists perform on individual songs. Well, this was a short record having four unique songs with their instrumentals and also so the tracks with vocals on them. I still thought that this was a pretty good record and it was one of the best Alchemist records I've listened to despite it being so short. I think that the Alchemist's exceptionally jazzy sound really came to life here, and I thought especially the Earl Sweatshirt feature made it really enjoyable to listen to. And so this album I gave an 8.4 out of 10. Next is Ransom and Rome Street's Coupe de Grace. This album specifically by them was really good and was about as good as the best songs on Noise Candy, which I'm pretty happy about. It consistently managed to keep their style while having two unique people to be accustomed to along with the other featured rappers. And so I thought this was a pretty good album and deserved a pretty high place this year, which is why I gave it an 8.4 out of 10. Number 13 on this list is Forever In Your Heart by Black Dresses. This was an electro-industrial album that still had a lot of elements of hyperpop in it, and Black Dresses are really good at making this really industrial, visceral sound, have this really melodic, emotional nature that doesn't carry across in a lot of other industrial albums. And so I really think that Black Dresses is one of the best duos to come out of this industrial hyperpop phase. And while they're technically split up, I hope that they release more post-split up albums like this one was, because I did really, really enjoy this record, along with their previous few albums, although I did think that this one is their best album to date. And so this one I gave an 8.4 out of 10 to. Number 12 on the list is Alluring the Distant Eye by Sadness again. I really, really like Sadness, which is why they're showing up so often. They managed to, despite having that typical black metal sound, have have more emotion than the typical depressive suicidal black metal record does in my opinion. And I think that it really, really comes off here. I think they did a fantastic job in both performance and composing. And so that's why I gave this one an 8.5 out of 10. Number 11 on this list is Fishmonger by Underscores. So this is obviously the previous record I was talking about when I was talking about Fearmonger. It's another one of those more electro punk records. And some of the songs on this record, like Spoiled Little Brat, are impossible to get out of your head. I tried, you can't do it. And so that's why I also gave this album an 8.5 out of 10. All right, we're down to the top 10. So number 10 on the list is Screaming Forest by Cemetery. This was, I guess you'd call it a Halloween record by black metal hip hop witch house musician Cemetery. This album had a lot less black metal elements than his previous albums had, instead opting for a more witch house sound, which I think is really cool because I really, really like witch house and I don't think it gets enough appreciation nowadays. I thought that the dark lyrical themes and the rapping on this album was very good, especially Buckshot's verse on Scarecrow. Again, you're not going to be able to get that out of your head. I tried. You physically cannot. I listened to that song on repeat countless times this year. I think it's a really good display of both Cemetery and Buckshot's vocal abilities. And so I think this album was really good as a whole, but especially that song. And so that's why I gave this album an 8.5 out of 10. Next is LP, the offline version by JPEG Mafia. 
And so I thought that the offline version, as everyone did, was a lot better than the online version. JPEG Mafia had a lot of songs on there that he wasn't allowed to include. And while Bold and Bold Remix weren't included on the offline version, which I actually really liked and wished it was on there, I still think that this version as a whole was a lot better because of the samples and because of songs like Hazard Duty Pay. I also thought that End Credits was a really, really good song. That's another one that you're not going to be able to get out of your head. And so that's why I gave this album an 8.6 out of 10. 0.3 points higher than LP Online. Number 8 on my list is Troubled Paradise by Slater. I guess that's how you pronounce it. It's got three Ys. This was a hyperpop record. And it was one of those records where every single song manages to go so well with the previous one that you kind of have to listen to the whole thing. It doesn't let you stop it in between. Um, I thought this was a really powerful record. And I'm really glad I found out about Slater thanks to one of my friends. Who I'm also going to link in the description. He's got a music blog and he has a lot of really good music tastes. Number 7 on the list is Headbangers 2 by Heart Eyes. This was an emo hyper pop record and while I'm unsure if there's even a Headbangers 1 for all I know this could be the first one. I thought this record was really really strong and it makes me want to go back and look at their discography to find out if there's a the first one. Uh, this album I gave an 8.7 out of 10. I kind of just think it fused the emo and hyperpop sounds really well, despite them already being at least somewhat linked. This album took them and fused them even more, and in my opinion made that sound even better. Number 6 on this list is Compilation 2 by Sadness. Again another Sadness record. This album is a compilation of some of the songs from Sadness's split releases that came out during this year. It was a second compilation to come out this year as well, but I thought that while the songs may have not been originally written to go together, they do work really well on this album. Maybe that's just because a lot of Sadness of songs kind of sound like they would work together anyway. Like I normally will shuffle through their whole discography instead of just one album. But I did really think that these three songs worked really well together. And so that's why I gave this album an 8.7 out of 10. Number 5 on my list is Rainbow Bridge 3 by Cemetery. This is another release by Cemetery, but this one had a lot more black metal influence in it. And I thought that the black metal samples were really good. I really love the Rainbow Bridge trilogy. Rainbow Bridge 2 is a little bit worse than Rainbow Bridge 1 and 3, but 1 and 3 are really really powerful, and using the black metal samples in this way I think is really cool, and I believe is pretty unique, because I haven't heard a lot of people in hip hop sample black metal. So I thought that he did a really good job pulling it off, even though it's something that's pretty new and unique, and so that's why I gave this album an 8.8 .8 out of 10. Number 4 on my list is Sin I Get Ready by Lingua Ignota. I believe that would be how you pronounce it. This was a gothic drone album that took a lot of elements from metal albums but kind of strayed away from the metal sound and it used a lot of religious ideas both musically and lyrically to create this really expansive droning album that still managed to crescendo when it needed to but also pull back and be more calm when it needed to and so i thought this was a really good album that balances these juxtaposing sounds and so that's why i gave this album an 8.9 out of 10. Number 3 on the list is another record by Sadness. I guess you would call it underscore 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 underscore. Um, I think most of his songs were written and recorded in 2018 and just released now. It's, it's me from the future. I'm coming back to tell you that upon doing just a, a smidgen of research, I found out that this album was actually originally released in 2018 and was only put on Bandcamp in 2021. So I don't know if this counts as a 2021 album but I'm not taking it off the list because I don't want to re-record the video. I'm kind of happy it was released at all because this is one of the best albums he's ever released and definitely the best album that Sadness has released this year. I thought it was really powerful and emotional. While there weren't a lot of songs on it, I thought that they worked really well together. And I thought that that more shoegazy sound works really well in this record with this DSBM sound. And so I gave this album a 9.1 out of 10. Number 2 on my list, which was number 1 until a couple hours ago, is Pale Swordsman by Ket Arak. I believe that's how you'd pronounce it again. This album by some people has been called Poetic Black Metal. I think it's just a regular DSPM album, but it's got a lot of really poetic sounds to it, as well as a lot of poetic lyrical content. Um, I think this album is really emotional. I think this album is really unique in the way it fuses the more dungeon synth piano-y feel of DSPM with the more aggressive hard hitting sounds of DSPM. And it also keeps a really raw guitar sound throughout it that makes it sound like it's a record that you'd find in a cassette in the snow somewhere in Norway. The way that there are sections of really hard hitting black metal as well as a really calm sections just make it such a unique listening experience. And I think it does a really amazing job at making it something you have to listen to. Again, I think this is one of those albums that 
You can't just listen to one song, you have to listen the whole way through, and it's worth it every time. This album I gave a 9.2 out of 10, and I can't sing enough praises for this album. I've listened to it probably at least a hundred times through fully, and I still can't get enough of it. I think it's really, really good. And the number one spot on this year, which only got changed earlier today when I listened to this album, and even though I've only listened to it once, I think it's fair that it's here, because this band's previous album was also a very similar rating, and I think that this album was really, really powerful and really, really interesting. That is Bellum One by Aquilus. I think Aquilus is one of the best sounds in atmospheric black metal, and definitely the best Australian atmospheric black metal band I've ever heard. This album took a lot of elements from classical. The pianos were really grand and beautiful, and it helped to make this black metal so much more expansive. And it also had really, really extended sections, where there weren't even any black metal elements. And so I think it takes a lot of work to make a neoclassical album that would feel like a really good neoclassical album on its own, and a black metal album that would feel like a really good black metal album on its own, and then combine them together and make it sound like a really good album together. And I think this album managed to achieve it, which is why I gave it a 9.3 out of 10. So that is my top 50 albums of this year. If you want to see the rest, you can look at my album of the year. That's where I've got the albums that weren't included on this list because I just didn't really think they were good enough. I listened to 108 new albums that were released this year. And so that means that over half of the albums just didn't get to make it on this list. And I'm planning on listening to even more next year. So we'll see how that goes. Hopefully I can get better at talking to a camera because I'm not used to this and it's hurting my throat. I'm dying right now. I'm literally dead. I also have to get so much better at editing. Holy shit. But this was something that was really fun to do because even though I'm not the most articulate person and I'm not the best at explaining why I like these albums, I do love gushing about the albums that I've listened to a lot of times this year. In any case, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one that I put onto my YouTube channel. Goodbye.